Hey, what's up, guys? I want to welcome you back to another episode of Street Theology, episode 36 today. Mm. 36, wow. what a raggedy number. That's a, that's that's a, like, that's a raggedy that's, number. There's I, I would have rather you that. not have even that's said what that. That's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, like, Can I mean, edit that out? As I said, there's not a number. Like, you know, a sports number. Like, you know, if you got number 36, like, in any sports team, you weren't very good. <laughs> hey, give him 36. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, give him 36. Buddy needs 36. Like, you know, what number? Like, what are you, a fullback? Like, there's no skill position in football. If you're a basketball player, like, 36. If I see 36 guard me in basketball, like, oh, yeah, I'm eating the night. If somebody got 36. So I'm eating a night. I'm eating a night. Hey, if that if that ref needs three hands to signal a foul, then it's just that, <laughs> the game's garbage, man. That's just <laughs> well, guys, the voice you hear there. We are excited today on episode 36. But let me tell you, we're going to redeem the number 36 right. today because of our guests, <laughs> because of what we're talking about. Mental health meets the streets. Um, this idea of mental health accountability. We are joined by Pastor Keith Tower. Pastor Keith is the lead pastor at High Point Church in Orlando, Florida. Beyond that, um, you know, Pastor Keith is a is really is a mental health professional as well. He works with corporations. He works with large churches. I mean, nonprofits in coming in and, and not only dealing with mental health, but also again, work with our staff on this idea of company culture and organizational culture. And again, and beyond that, again, this was years uh, years ago, but also Keith, you know, stands at seven feet tall, used to play for the Orlando hey. Magic. And so me and Keith have known each other for, gosh, almost 20 years now. Um, yep. We're part of the same ministry. And so uh, Pastor Keith, welcome to Street Theology, man. We're glad you're here today. Adrian, so so great to be with you, and uh, man, it's an honor to be on Street Theology, even with the raggedy 36, uh, and we are going to make something better of it, but uh, it's it's always been such a pleasure over the years to to work with you on the projects that you're doing, and you're, you're, you're always ahead or on the front edge of what the church needs to be talking about theologically, and I so appreciate you addressing this issue of mental health, and the, the areas where we've worked together directly, it's been a, a, a true uh, honor of mine. And in the areas where we haven't worked together directly, but I know we're both working in the same direction, man, it's just an honor to have a, a co-laborer out there uh, like you. So appreciate being with you. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate you. And um, and again, you know, guys, um, I want to say this before we jump into the pod, Pastor Keith was one of those guys to where he's always been a great, as we, you know, he's been a great encouragement. You know, sometimes when we're leading out and trying to, as he said, doing stuff different, he's always been the guy in the background, like, you know, rooting us on, saying, no, 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 no keep going. You know, when you think you're almost, I'm crazy, he's like, no, 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 you're not, keep going. Um, and it's been really great. And also, he's been one of those guys on the front line for a long time, I mean, even longer than me, talking on this idea of like mental health and how it intersects with the gospel Bible, because it's a real important topic and issue. You know, we had Dr. Zoda on, yeah. you know, we talked yeah. about it, you know, episodes, you know, we had, uh, again, you know, we talked about this idea of postpartum depression and what does that look like for moms and things like that. But pastor Keith is going to be what I really love. And we're going to dive into this. I really love about Keith's work is the fact of being an expert at what he does, but then having this really high regard for the Lordship of Christ, mm. you know, because a lot of times people can help you point to an issue. But one thing I love about Keith is I would tell people, like I've learned this from him at the bottom of it all though. It's like that we get there is really getting to the idea that there's idols underneath there and we got to dig them up underneath all of our pain. And so he really does a good job of not being an expert, but then also having the ability to call people to repentance where they need to be called to repentance. And then also being able to work in both worlds. You know I mean? He has that unique thing of what we do here. He can work in corporate world and, be great oh, yeah. and then work in the church world. So again, we're getting a great treat. Um, I'm going to spend time. Plus I said, it's a good friend. He's doing this for us, you know, again, uh, for the free. So we really appreciate that. People pay him a lot of money. So I really <laughs> appreciate, you know, I really appreciate uh, again that. Hey, Keith is just like back in the day, man, just setting pick and rolls. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you guys, you're going to set a nice pick for me and you're going to roll, be wide open. And I'm just going to go ahead and lay it up and not throw it to you. You know what I'm saying? But I appreciate hey, it. If, I, if, I, if I can get you open to look good, brother, that's all. <laughs> there we go. Well, Keith, man, we're going to dive right into this and, um, and really, sure. man, I think tell the people a little bit about, you know, about who you are and kind of like your experience, like with, you know, in the church space, but also just with mental health, you know, in the counseling space, like sure. just kind of tell me a little bit of your story. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, gosh, growing up, I was always the, the kid that people came to for advice or wisdom. And at the time, you don't necessarily know why. But by the time I got to college, I, I wanted to I just wanted to help people. Uh, well, first I wanted to play basketball, but I knew someday I would be done playing basketball and I wanted to set myself up to be able to help other people in whatever capacity. So I had a, got a degree in psychology from the University of Notre Dame, 
and then played seven years of professional basketball. And as I, my career, I, I felt like it was ending. I was still healthy, but I just kind of knew, you know, knew it was time. And um, so I, I started applying to grad school, applied to Indiana University to get into their counseling program. And in, <laughs> a Notre Dame guy applying to Indiana <laughs> would be like, you guys as Seminoles applying to like Miami or FS or UM, right? UM, right? Where you're, yep. <laughs> you know, you don't know much about it other than it's those guys. So I just, I applied there honestly, because I thought, oh, gosh, it's Indiana. It's gotta be simple to get into, right? Anybody <laughs> can go there. And, uh, turn, <laughs> turns out it was a top five program in mental health counseling in the country. And had I known that I would not have applied. I'd have gone, I'd have found an even worse school. <laughs> uh, but so I, I started literally, I retired from from professional basketball and the next week I was starting my mental health career. So um, got my master's degree there. And, and about the time I, I came out and was starting to set up my professional practice, I was also simultaneously being called into full-time ministry. And I really ran two parallel paths for the for the for about the last 20 years where I've been working in private practice counseling. I've been uh, in ministry, whether missions or uh, now pastoring a church for the last 16. And um, I, I like to say it like this, what, what I learned from my mental health counseling has been the greatest asset other than Jesus in the Bible to my ministry. And what I know about Jesus in the Bible and ministry has been the greatest asset to my counseling. Because Jesus described the wise man in, in Luke 6 as the one who can hear the word and put it into practice. There's a lot of people that hear the word and can put it in their head, but they can't put it into, into applied life. Like, how do I actually live according to this word? And what I learned in counseling really is how people are wired and built and how to help them, you know, get the obstacles out of their way so that they can take what's the truth of scripture, not truth of psychology, the truth of what is true because it's in the created order by God who made everything. And it's true and the best way for people to live. And how do I actually now take that truth and apply it? So in the counseling side, I have the truth of scripture that I now can help them apply. And then on the pastoring side, I have the application that comes from counseling, how to get all the obstacles out of the way and diagnose where people are. And now again, let them apply the truth of scripture. So it's been a, for the last 20 years, it's been a, uh, a really unique marriage. I think that's helped uh, my ministry and um, helped my counseling practice. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I mean, it sounds like you've been at both lanes for quite some time. And so I kind of want to, mm-hmm. want to come up with a big question because I think it's applicable to a guy like yourself who's, who's running both lanes like this. We're, we're seeing a lot of moral failure in terms of uh, senior leadership, but we're also seeing a lot of uh, poor mental health. And so I'm wondering uh, with your, your feet in both camps, is there a link between the two? Uh, what, what's kind of going on? What's going on there? Yeah, so that's a, yeah, let's just go ahead and start big. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. And, and I would say the answer is uh, there's not a link and yet there's a link. And, and here, here's what I mean. So when you think of a moral failing, you're, you're talking about an issue of sin at some regard. Uh, and sin is not necessarily the result of a mental health issue, right? So the, they're, they're separate. And just in the same way, if I have a physical health issue, that doesn't necessarily automatically mean I'm going to sin. Yet, we also know, whether it's the spiritual realm, the emotional realm, the physical realm, that there is a lot of interplay, right? Uh, I mean, gosh, I'm a big guy. I eat all the time. And if I don't get to eat and I get hungry, I get hangry, right? So my attitude, I can get, I'm much more likely to be sinful in my attitude, sinful in how I talk to people when I'm having a physiological issue, I'm hungry or I've, I've, I'm tired. So if I'm not taking care of my physical body, that doesn't inherently, isn't necessarily sinful when we have those seasons, but it's sure gonna make me more likely and more susceptible uh, to temptation. I would say that's the same way with mental and emotional health with regards to, to moral failings, right? If I'm not taking care of my mental and emotional health, that's not inherently means I'm gonna sin, but depending on the, 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 the lack of care, if you will, with regards to my mental and emotional health, it can sure put me in a susceptible place to sin. I was uh, reading in, in uh, 1 Kings 19 and I love in verse Four. This is the prophet Elijah, right? The big dog of the Old Testament, other than, you know, Moses. One of two people in the world that appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. So we're talking one of the like ultimate champions in the history of humanity. And he just had his incredible moment in 
uh, First Kings 18 with the prophets of Baal and there are 400 people trying to call down fire. And then he like soaks his sacrifice in water and calls down fire. And he's at the top of his game. And then it says he then goes out. And because Jezebel decides to speak poorly of him, he goes out and in verse four, it says he despaired to the point where he asked God to kill him. Now, sometimes we can sort of read over that and go, oh, he's having a bad day. He's actively suicidal right after the greatest moment. I, I cannot tell you how many people in ministry I've seen at the top of their game, right? Top of their fame, people pointing to, and whether it's an issue of pride or something else going on in their soul, they're, they're, they're empty and they're void, right? And, and, but then it's crazy because he goes out into the wilderness. He's actively suicidal, highly depressed, right? He's got a lot of emotional things going on when we might go, oh man, because we get caught all the time by people in moral failures and go, why them? They had it all going on as if somehow that's a safeguard, right? Against a sin issue. And then we see him out there in the rest of Acts, uh, um, I'm sorry, First Kings 19. And I find it interesting because an angel does come to minister to him, but it's, it, it blows me away what the angel says to him. The first thing he says is, hey, lay down and take a nap. <laughs> and then he comes and wakes him up mid nap and goes, now get up and eat something. And he gets up and eats and he goes, go take another nap which by the way, is your biblical license for a good solid 20 minute hey! for the rest of your life. But, he, but on two different occasions, he says, take a nap and he says, get up and eat. And he goes, go back to sleep. And he says, get up and eat. And then he addresses the issue at hand. And the, what he addresses is a sense of mission. Like, hey, look, I got something for you. Let's get about a journey. So th there's something, does mental and emotional health lead to moral failures? No, I don't, there's not a connection there because there's plenty of people living moral, upright, righteous lives while struggling with mental health issues. However, I think anytime we talk about neglect of emotional health or physical health, I think it makes us much more susceptible to some of the dark places our, our temptation, sin mind likes to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought that, um, no, and that's, an, that's a great analogy. Uh, and I, I think I would ask this question to follow up is that, You know, you see it, like I said, people are at the top of their game. Why, Keith, do you believe that that's one of the places, again, this amount, not, maybe it's not so much mental health, but it does go to more levels, maybe spiritual warfare or, and again, sometimes spiritual warfare can lead to this idea of things like ultimately that could be even like internally within us. Like, you know, like Elijah has this incredible moment where he literally sees the power of God. I mean, literally a meteorite mm -hmm. from heaven, like, you know what I'm saying? Comes out of the sky, sets the sacrifice on fire, but like something as small as, Jezebel like you know talking about hey either you're gonna die or I'm gonna die kind of thing why yeah. why does that happen on those heightened moments you think you know what mm -hmm. I mean like in your years of working with people in your years in your own experience where you had those high moments where God shows up as powerful and then it's like and I know this happens to me it's like right after it's like man you feel like you can just get to a place of such a low mm -hmm. yeah. why is that yeah you know, that's, that's a great question. And if, and if we really could bottle that, I think we'd have a lot happier people because it's amazing. You know, we don't have, I mean, in, in fairness to Elijah, Jezebel did say she wanted to kill him. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, <laughs> but, but, but we're seeing something there in human nature, right? Because we can see a, a, you know, a troll on Instagram and all of a sudden we can go in the tank on one person's opinion. And I, I know we're at some point, we'll probably be talking about self-awareness, but there, there is a measure of self-awareness that requires to actually have self-awareness. I actually need feedback from my environment. Um, and we are in a hyper feedback environment. Every single thing we do is, is in real time being addressed, I think before we have a chance to process it. And there's, you know, there's something about, you know, had Elijah or any of us had the chance to sit back and process, I think the first thing we do is go, wow, I was actually pretty darn fortunate to be sitting in a situation where God did something ridiculous, right? But usually when it happens, we're kind of amped up and we're, you know, probably taking a little bit of partial credit, like, yeah, in your face, Ahab, and all that kind of stuff <laughs> that I, I think when things are going well, before we've really got to settle in what God did and really how fortunate we are to be a part of it, I, I think our own pride gets in there a little bit. And, um, and that just makes us super susceptible to those little digs. And um, I, think, I think too, um, this, the, the human, natural human struggle with insecurity, 
right? And we've got an adversary, a devil who hates us and knows all of our insecurities and he knows just what button to push. Um, and I think the less insecurities we have, which is not the result of getting rid of insecurities as much as being secure and settled into who God has made you to be and, and being satisfied with that, um, I think that gives less room for, you know, what other opinions uh, there are that might throw you off. So That was really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, obviously we see that humans have the tendency to overcorrect a lot um, and mental mm -hmm. health has become way more of a topic of conversation than it has been in the past. Do you see yeah. an overcorrection in this space, specifically in the church, where mental health can almost become a scapegoat, even for sin in, in ways mm. that you just mentioned? Uh, yes, I think that's another propensity of, of human nature is, is to overcorrect. I, I, I think a safeguard to overcorrecting is, is having, having accurate principles, right? So I love, there's a, a model that Johns Hopkins put out that we, we lead our staff through and any of our leaders and, and it's it's simply this with regards to mental and emotional health there's there's a continuum of of three stages that they identify first is resistance then resilience then recovery resistance is uh it's really the initial coping skills that we all need to deal with life right sometimes you have to have a thick skin uh but you gotta have a tender heart you've got to you know take care of your body you've got to rest like it's all the things that if you were to say Hey, if you want to have good, healthy, emotional, and physical health, these are the things you need to do. And we should, in a perfect world, be learning those as we, as we grow up and testing those out in life. And, and we have resistance. Resilience is when life hits us, even if we have the greatest coping skills in the whole wide world, life hits us sometimes and we get knocked out. So I, I like to liken it to a person taking a walk, right? If, you're, if I'm walking through this journey of life, resistance is the skill to actually walk. I learn how to walk. I learn if I see a pothole, how to navigate around it. I learn how to, you know, this, the, the, the body movements to go uphill, downhill, handle different terrain. And I can have all the walking skills in the whole wide world, but sometimes you get knocked over. Sometimes we're careless and we trip. Sometimes there was an obstacle we didn't see. Sometimes somebody maliciously sticks their foot out or puts the banana peel out or whatever it might be, but we get knocked down. So then resilience would be, can I, while I'm down, do a quick scan to make sure nothing's you know, major, my legs are still attached. And can I now reapply while down, can I get back up and reapply the skills of resistance to journey back through life? And what we used to do, I, th I think if, if we erred and, and, and if we're overcorrecting, I think what happened is when people would fall, emotionally speaking or mentally speaking or whatever it might be, you know, life happens and they find themselves flat as we used to just get, do the old school, get up and rub some dirt on it and without giving them time to, to, to self-evaluate. Because sometimes it's just a skinned knee and I got to brush it off and start reapplying resistance. Sometimes your leg's broken. And when my leg is broken, I do not anymore have the ability to get up and reapply the skills of resistance to merge through life. I actually need to go to the hospital. That's the place of recovery. The most appropriate thing for some falls is the emergency room. And that's why I get recovery. I have surgery, I go through rehab and all the surgery and the rehab from a natu natural sense, the whole purpose of that is so that I will eventually be able to go back to the beginning and reapply resistance and walk again, right? So if you, if you think of it in terms of a journey, what happens um, emotionally, we, maybe we have good skills of resistance, maybe we don't, but life happens form a uh, gosh, this pandemic. I mean, we can talk about that all day and the mental health in a pandemic and what, what it's caused, but people were getting knocked down emotionally, so to speak. And we used to say, you know, get up and rub some dirt on it. And, and people have been hobbling and they're trying to s raise their hand and go, no, it really hurts. And we're going quit being a baby. Right. And, and now what's happened, I think if the pendulum has overcorrected and it, it has in some circles, but uh, is what we've said is every stumble is trauma now. So before we were saying, rub some dirt on a broken leg. Now we're saying, you got a little boo-boo, trauma, go to the emergency room and get surgery. And, and some of the things I think we're prescribing 
are too invasive for what actually happened. Because there's real dignity in being able to look at somebody and say, you have it within you to get back up and start moving, right? I think it's, it's not dignifying to call somebody a wimp and get up when they're actually hurt, when the most dignifying thing we can do is get them to the hospital. But particularly, gosh, you hear it. Uh, I, I mean, you know, Bree, you're recently on a college campus. The word trauma is one of the most overused terms. Everything, so traumatic, the most traumatic thing happened. <laughs> yeah. And what happened was real life. You, you stubbed your toe. And I'm not, I'm not saying it didn't hurt. I'm just saying, walk it off. Adrian can attest, you know, when you're a basketball player, every basketball player ever has rolled their ankle on multiple occasions. And I've rolled my ankle and broke it. I've rolled my ankle and tore ligaments. I've rolled my ankle and it's been nothing. Every single rolled ankle feels the same. You roll it and you go, oh my gosh. And it hurts to the pit of your stomach. And, and what, what every trainer does is go, get up and start walking it off. And what they're trying to determine is the, the level of damage based on whether they want to see you start walking. And the vast majority of them, you start walking again, that loosens back up. Okay. And you're good. Now you're gonna, you know, you got to tend to it a little bit, maybe a day off, but you'll still be able to run and play. Sometimes you, you go to get up and, and just in the idea of trying to reapply that step, it's obvious that more damage has been done. It, a trauma has happened to that area and an appropriate thing would be surgery or any number of things. So I, if there's an overcorrection, the overcorrection was happens in that resilience place. We used to say, ah, nobody needs mental health. We'll just pray for it or re, you know, take two scriptures and call me in the morning or suck it up buttercup or whatever it was. And now I think we realize ah, that's a mistake. So now we're sending everybody to the emergency room which I think is also a mistake. I think there's certainly, absolutely, unequivocally a time for the counseling office, uh, but not every hardship of life is called for the counseling office. We have to have a, that sense of resilience to, to be able to go, okay, I can self-diagnose, I can talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about, and can I handle this? Yep, all right, let's get back up and start walking together again, so. That's fantastic, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a, a, a great one, particularly for people who are, yeah, you know, people in churches who are there, they they want to, they they want to help lead, they want to help um, lead the church in discipleship and things like that. So, what, you know, the the uh, the relationship between um, discipleship and like self awareness or mental emotional health, mm -hmm. like who's is it? What's the responsibility of either church leadership or probably you know more for our listeners like the like the, the laity, so to speak? Whose responsibility is mm -hmm. that? Should that is this something that, man, we should always be handing off to mental health professionals like yourself? What's the level here? Help us walk in wisdom. and with yeah. Us. Uh, yeah, so I think, I, I think it's always good to know your limits of being helpful. I think one of, one of the ways insecurity shows itself in, in helping is we feel like when we don't have an answer, uh, we start to feel inadequate and insecure. So we just over spiritualize something, right? Pray more, get more faith, because we don't know what we don't know what else to say. So we actually keep some condemning things on them, like, well, if you had enough faith, and, you know, and we, uh, you, you know, well, okay, well, that you, great, great, you know. Or, I know you're anxious and struggling with anxiety, so here's a verse that says, "Be anxious for nothing." Well, way to just take my anxiety over the roof, right? Because now, now the Bible also doesn't want me to be anxious. Ah, I mean, and there's there's an application of the word of God uh, mm -hmm. that I think we need to have. And one of the simplest things is, is it's okay to not know something, right? We're not all experts in this field. Um, one of the things that everybody can do is be present with people. I think one of the greatest gifts you can give to anybody who's in a difficult place and difficult situation is being personally present. That doesn't require any special skill other than basic human kindness. And, uh, and, and it cannot be overstated how important it is to be present with somebody. In fact, the number one determinant, the number one deterrent of suicide is somebody else knowing and being there. And so if it can literally keep people from death, then being present with people is a life and death matter. So having a, a holistic perspective to discipleship, right? Where uh, we understand that, that we, we have a physical component to it, right? Sometimes discipleship gets spiritualized. I, I like to say if, if all you have is a hammer, every problem's a nail, 
So if, if I'm a Christian and all I have is the Bible, then everything is going to be addressed spiritually. If I'm a doctor and all I have is medicine, then everything's going to be addressed with a pill. If I'm a counselor and all I know how to do is talk and listen, then everything's going to be addressed by sit on that couch and, you know, tell me about your mother. So, but if, if we look and say, we are physical beings, right? We are spiritual beings. We do have a, a mind and emotions. And so what would discipleship look like that addresses the, the whole person? This is one of the things that I, I love about what you guys do is, is you don't, you don't just kind of deconstruct a person to one facet and try to address it. You're looking at a, at a total person and going, how can we apply the, the gospel and Christian community and practical wisdom and, you know, insight that's gained through, like, how do we bring all that to bear to help people flourish? Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't, basically this, do, do what you can, not what you can't. If it's beyond your expertise, get somebody that knows more. If, if simply being present is all you can do, you're giving people a real gift. Yeah, that's really good. And I think, you know, why that's good, because I always think about this, Keith, I think about the fact that when Jesus, you know, he did all these different miracles, he did them many different ways. And it's because he was yep. actually always present. Like he gave people yep. what they needed, not maybe what they wanted, but what yep. they needed. And, you know, yep. I try to remind people is that the same Holy Spirit that actually, you know, rose, you know, raised Jesus from the dead, which, you know, Paul wrote now lives within us. So the same wisdom, we can have yep. it. And that wisdom sometimes is to tell us like, Hey, this is over your pay grade right now. Mm. And it's okay yep. to tell people yep. it's over your pay grade. I'll never forget sitting there with John Mark. Co I mean, I started with uh, Tim Mackey of the Bible project. And, and yeah. this spoke to me so much on leadership. Somebody asked him a question. Again, yeah. he's one of the top Bible teachers in the world. And right. he sat there. He's like, huh, that's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer to that. I'll look into that. And I yeah. was like, oh, man, Gosh. a guy like yeah. that who can say yeah. that, how much yeah. more for me when I'm like, yeah, this is out of my depth. And I think that's okay to say that. Man, this is yeah. out of my depth. You know, it doesn't because I think so many times we, we, we will put it on. It's like, well, you know, I want to make sure it's, as a Christian and say you're ministering to somebody who's not a Jesus follower. You're like, I want to make sure I'm representing Jesus. Yep. Well, I'm like, dude, Jesus doesn't need a PR job. Like he's got mm. this like over, over 2000 <laughs> years. He's, he's yeah. fine. He'll be okay. But many times that's masking our own anxieties of how we look and us not having yeah. answers. You yeah. know what I mean? And so I, I, I think I want to speak to that part, Keith, of like, how sure. do you in moments, you know, we talk a lot here about self-awareness and one of the ways you get mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, as you know, Dr. Zoda, well, it's like the idea of being an expert of self, right? How do you in those yeah. moments like dial down like in real time your anxiety like to where, you know, you start feeling that thing in you. You know, if you're pa talking to your children about something and they say something, you're like, yeah. oh, man, every bad thing you can think yeah. about your children. You know, they like, you know, they're telling you, hey, dad, you know, like me as a father, you keep them. You have, you're having two daughters like me having girls and my dad. The first time my daughter told him, yeah, dad, I think this boy is cute. And literally I go to the end thing of literally into like, oh my God, she's going to get pregnant. Like, you know what I'm saying? You're like, like, like all she just, you know, and you want them to open up and tell you stuff. But then you're like, okay, how yeah. do I respond in a way that's not anxious, but I'm really anxious right now. And I really want to lock her in, you know, a dungeon and just like, you know, whatever. So like, how do you do that in real time? Keith? Yeah. So, so gr great question, right? Because I think, I think it's the I think it's what we feel on the inside that starts to show on the outside that makes people determine whether they're going to continue to share with us or not. Um, and so I you know I always go back to I'm a I'm a big fan of the military. I always go back to my friends that are Navy SEALs and they one of their taglines is or one of their kind of mottos is when the going gets tough the tough relax, right? And to to be able to do difficult things that doesn't require you getting all mustered up. It actually requires you to be able to still yourself and quiet yourself. And I think, I think practicing stillness and practicing quieting is um, it's really a lost uh, in many ways, devotional habit that we have and the ability to, to quiet yourself. And reality is too, even if you're not quiet uh, on the inside, you sure need to look quiet on the outside. So having, I think every pastor, I think anybody that wants to help people, you, there's a couple words you have to get out of your vocabulary. Wow, should never come out of your mouth when somebody's <laughs> proposing something. Or really? Oh, wow. Never heard that before. Like, right. So you, you, you always have to work. It, people need to assume that whatever they're saying to you, you've heard before. And so, so I've changed a lot of my language when 
people start talking. And, and even when I'm screaming on the inside going, oh no, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? Is I, I've just trained something to come out of my mouth that usually says, hey, listen, I want you to know you're not the first person that's ever, ever that's told me this. Or I want you to know, here's the good news. You're not the first person that's ever experienced this. Now that's true because there's nothing new under the sun. So even as I'm telling them, you know, I, I'm not going, what? Or wow, I'm also training my face to go neutral to slightly, I'm here for you, positive. Uh, I'm not going to say something that sounds like I'm shocked by what they're telling me. And I'll usually affirm that, listen, you're not the first person that's told me this, or you're not the first person that's gone through this. And there's something about humanity, right, where we, we don't like to tell people our stuff. It just feels like, because we're, we're constantly, you know, if, if you think you're anxious to hear something, how anxious is the one that's telling you something, right? And the, the courage it takes them needs to be met with, with equal courage on your side. Um, so if they're willing to tell me something and take that risk of, uh, of, of faith, they're going to be met with something that sounds like, thank you so much for your courage. Uh, you're not the first person that's told me about that. Tell me more, right? And, and if I just do that much inside, I'm going, you know, <laughs> when the going gets tough to tough, better relax like now, you know, so <laughs> and it's just some simple things, that, uh, a breath or two, but buying yourself a, a minute or two. I'll never forget uh, one day I was um, very, relatively new in counseling, relatively new in ministry. And I was, uh, our church at the time was doing, you know, had a, just a killer service on freedom or whatever. And I'm standing up at the front, you know, it was like the, Hey, if you want somebody to pray for you, you come on up. So I'm, you know, I'm brand new to the prayer team and, you know, barely saved and, you know, know enough counseling to be sort of helpful. And, and, uh, and a guy came up and I'm like, you know, oh, great. I get to pray. And I said, I said, how can I pray for you? And, and I'll never forget the first time I've ever done altar ministry. And he said, well, I'm, I'm wondering if you could pray for me. I'm, I'm going to prison tomorrow uh, for um, I'm a, I'm a sexual predator and I'm going to prison tomorrow and I'm afraid I'm going to be killed. Mm. Wow. Okay, you, yeah. you better wow. be ready with a poker face. <laughs> now, I had a, at the time, I had a six and four year old daughter, and the dad in me says, I'll help those guys and choke you out right now, right? I mean, just being real, uh, the, 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 I was equal parts repulsed uh, by what he had done, and he just starts walking me through it and repenting and, I'm equal parts like I have no idea what to say to you right now, um, but I was also going. Jesus loves this man, and uh, if I can be present for him now, uh, maybe you know. And I, I, what do you say? I, I don't know. So here's what I said: You're not the first person that's gone through this. I just want you to know that you're not alone. And him, all that he. I'm the first person, other than like his legal team that, that I was the only person in that room that knew what was happening in his life. And for him to not be alone, the courage it would take to share that with somebody else needs to be met with. I'm here with you, right? Cause the enemy would always say, you can't tell them, you know what they're going to say, you know, those judgmental Christians. And I'm like, well, I'm just not going to be that. And, um, you know, so gave his life to Jesus. I don't really don't know what happened to him. Once he went away, he's probably still locked up. It's been in a you know a couple decades now, but um, yeah. yeah. So I would just say, re when in doubt, <laughs> relax. How do you relax? I buy my I usually buy myself a few you know thirty seconds or so, and still my heart and say, this person needs to encounter have a moment with God. And if I God looks like me at the moment, then I'm gonna give them something uh, of my presence. Wow. So. No, that's really, really good. And that's, I mean, that's a great wisdom. And that's what I think the one thing we love about that, why we even started this podcast was that it was the fact of taking, you know, theology, taking things spiritually into the street level and what you just did. And I hope everyone listening yeah. understands that you just brought something that was very street level because mm -hmm. I think what we have failed to, what we have missed in our culture today is we have more access more conversations around very lofty, very important theological concepts, but we've lost the yep. ability to say, how does those concepts play out in real life to people? Because yep. they have to play out in real yep. life to people because they don't matter. If it stays up here, which you need to talk about those things, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't yep. come down here, then at the end of the day, it's, 
our faith is really, honestly, I believe our faith many times is worthless to a hurting world that really needs, especially now, they yep. need hope. Yep. They need to be challenged. They yep. need to be faced with truth. But how do you bring that in a way? And I think so many times today, why we have such division, and especially among many times among Jesus followers is because of what you just said. Our anxieties are so high. And it's like what you, you made a great point. He's like, I can't tell this guy, you know, even though you're praying for this guy, man, you're not alone. Man, I mean, in today's yeah. culture, every mm. right, crazy, fundamentalist Christian yeah. be like, oh, or even, no, even far left, man, that guy, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah. I can't believe you said yeah. that God, you know, da, da, da. And it's just like, yeah. Yeah. you know, but it's like yeah. having the resilience. And I think that goes into my next question, Keith, is that one of the yeah. things we're realizing is that, you know, and I know you've done this, we talk so much about self-awareness, right? But one of the things yes. when I talk about authenticity is self-awareness and resilience to remain yep. self-aware. One thing that's yep. lacking in our culture, and I think you mentioned this, but it's the idea of like resilience, right? We don't have yep. we don't have things in place. Now, again, I'm gonna be careful. There's some people because just life, right? You grow up in inner city of Chicago, there's some about life that's gonna force you to have to have some level of resilience just to survive. But but if you look yes. at it back in the day, no matter how you grew up, man, like we just have to wait for, you know. If we uh, if we wanted somebody liked us or not, we had to send them a note, and we normally didn't know to the next day, right? Like you had to wait, or you know what I'm saying? Like it's like, man, we had to, you know, if you had an issue with somebody in school the next day, you had a full day, yeah. And it's like, listen, if you got in a fight the next day, the beef was real. You know what I'm saying? Like the beef was real because you had time to sleep on it. You're like, no, the energy was still high. You're like, you're just gonna fight, right? Like because, but nowadays it's like you said, it's the instant feedback, mm. and what's yeah. happening is. And, and also instant gratification, Amazon Prime, yes. Netflix, all the stuff. Keith, I think the question I'm going to ask you in a Jesus space and as leaders and also people who, who are listening to this, who have children who they're leading or other people they're pouring their lives into, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we actually help do that? Maybe I don't know if it's so much how much we help build resilience, but also maybe you can point mm -hmm. to things in life that really help people build resilience, because yeah. I believe the lie of today's age is authenticity is just whatever I feel. That's what I am. But it's like, right. once you become aware, there has to be a toughness in order to remain that way. Because with instant feedback, Correct. you're going to want to be whatever it is that everybody likes. So I guess I would ask you, how do we help cultivate resilience without crushing people's emotions? Because we grew up, yes. Keith, in a world where it's like, yo, like, nobody care about that. Suck that up. Like, you know what I'm saying? But that's not healthy. But then on the other side now, like you said, we live in a world now where it's like, as soon as you say something, is what you just said, oh, I feel I'm tr I'm triggered and I have trauma issues now because I just said like, yeah, yeah like, no, you know, you're five foot one, 400 pounds. You're not yeah. LeBron. I, I'm yeah. sorry. I wish you yeah. were, but you're not. Yeah. So, so uh, I don't know if you yeah. can speak to that. Okay, great, great. So there, there's a... I'm going to answer a couple different things because I, I hear a couple different things. I hear a question about resilience um, and I hear a question really about self-awareness and then both kind of how they interplay. So let me first talk about resilience. I, I think, honestly, I think resilience is the wrong goal. Um, I think we've elevated it to a place uh, that's less than, than um, that's not as high as what God has for us. So Right, so there, there, there's a concept. Somebody wrote a book. I, I can't remember who. It's not a Christian book, but the concept is true of humanity, and the concept is called anti-fragile, right? So, um, so if you think of like a something fragile, right, uh, a nice crystal, you know, wine glass, right? It's what makes it. What mean when we say that that thing is fragile and delicate is if you squeezed it, if you applied pressure, if you you know, you, you, you leaned into it, it's going to shatter, right? So we don't want to create fragility where, because life has pressure to it, right? There's, there is resistance we're going to face and you wouldn't lead, you know, you wouldn't push something heavy leading with a fragile wine glass because the fragility of pressure, it, it shatters. So what we've, I think, substituted instead of trying to have fragility is trying to, you know, we've, we've elevated resilience, but I, I if, if fragility would be like the crystal wine glass, um, resilience would be like a child sippy cup. Like I, I remember when my kids were little and I, I set it on the car and put my kids in and I backed out and it rolled off and I ran over their sippy cup. Okay, I ran it over in a Ford F-150 pickup truck, right? However many thousands of pounds that thing weighs. 
and dude, I went back and picked it up and the thing just boing right back into shape. Like, right. So resilience is you can put pressure on it, but as soon as the pressure is released, boop, it goes back where it was. And what I think though, is this idea of anti-fragile is actually how God's made us where pressure doesn't, shouldn't shatter us and pressure shouldn't just malform us until it's removed. And then we go back to shape. Pressure actually should make us stronger, right? You think of lifting weights. There's something about getting under the weight and exerting that actually builds muscle. You think of stretching your mind of getting into, you know, challenging, you know, racial conversations and expanding your mind. It's in the, it's in the stretching, it's in the squeezing, it's in the, the pressing that actually makes us not what we were, but what we can yet become, right? It's the same thing with the spiritual disciplines. When you focus and you read your Bible and you discipline your body and you discipline yourself spiritually, it's actually, that's how you become something better than what you were. And I think we've elevated resilience. Now, I, I understand why, because we, we're, 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 we're losing any level of toughness. We have fragility. But I think, I think the, the better goal is to understand that some stress is good, right? There's three types of stress. There's eustress, distress, and dysfunction. Eustress is good stress. That's when, you know, uh, gosh, it's, I got a final tomorrow. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't study all month but the finals tomorrow and that impending deadline has this incredible ability to focus, right? Now I can, the parties that like, you know, snag, like I, I can lock in and focus now on this book that for a month I couldn't read, but now I can because of some pressure. You know this from, from your, your time in the sports world, right? Everyone's like hey, screaming and yelling in the stands trying to distract you. And you're like, dude, we just, we, I, I, we just don't even hear you. I'm aware of 10 people on the floor and my coach sometimes, right? But th this ability under pressure, under a tight game, it actually causes us to, to focus more. So we've tried to remove anything that's bad or negative from, from our environment where some pressure actually is good. Too much overwhelms us and that causes distress, right? Where it actually too much stress hurts my performance, but some stress improves my performance. Too much hurts it. And then dysfunction is where I get completely overwhelmed. So I would say our, our understanding that stress and pressure and resistance is actually how I grow and what makes me better and makes me become, I immediately now decide to not avoid it, but decide to embrace it. Let me, if I can just jump on this part of, of, of self-awareness um, because I, I mentioned it earlier, self-awareness is one of those things that, that requires a measure of toughness because it's kind of a misnomer. Self-awareness can't just be discovered alone. It, you have to have external feedback to actually develop self-awareness. You, you mentioned earlier in the podcast, I'm seven feet tall. Well, I don't walk around, honestly, with any awareness of how tall I am. I forget all the time how tall I am until one of two things happens. I walk through a doorway and didn't duck and I bang my head, right? And real-time feedback that I'm taller than the average person right? Boom. Okay. Yeah. Didn't see that there. Or I'll see a, you know, we'll take a, a group photo and, 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 and I'm looking at the photo and I'm going, okay, <laughs> dude, I'm, I'm gigantic. Like I, I just, because I don't see me, hmm. I don't know how big I am. And then I'll, when people be like, Oh, you're so intimidating. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like the nicest guy ever. Yeah. But you're so big. I'm like, am I? And then I'll look at a photo and go, <laughs> I'm huge, right? So, but there's something about external feedback that of, of both, um, I bumped my head. So one of the things that we've, that we've, I think we've done as a society is we've removed authentic feedback and that's created fragility, right? So if, so that any authentic feedback is seen as mean, any authentic feedback is seen as whatever, so, right? So it's your, it's your, 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 your little kid playing little league, right? And he strikes out 15 times and, and his parents are going, that's okay. You're the best player ever. Well, first of all, the kid knows you're lying, but sec second, or, or, or nobody wins, nobody loses. Everyone gets a blue ribbon. What, what I'm removing is actual feedback. And, and, and I wonder how many of the world's great artists or the world's great musicians, we will never know about their art or musichood because somebody keeps telling them they're a great baseball player. Like, 
bro, you, you, this is not your gift. <laughs> One of the most valuable things a person can, can learn is what they're not and what they're not good at. But a parent wants them to go to the majors and doesn't want them to feel bad and is trying to comfort them for striking out every time all season. So they just keep lying to him and saying, you're the best, you're the best. Instead of having authentic feedback going, hey, we'll stick it out. But once the season's over, let's go take trombone lessons. I mean, there's something else perhaps you're gifted at. Gosh, uh, turn on American Idol, right? You see it, they're all, you, you watch somebody stand up and, and you can just see the look on, you know, on Simon's face and the judges and you go, somebody should, should have told that person a long before this that they they don't have it and instead they've told them they did so when we remove authentic feedback right i bumped my head you've struck out enough you can't sing uh then what we're doing is we're setting people up for failure and then the kind of the, the photo when i see myself standing next to somebody in a picture i think we need important relationship excuse me relational mirrors honestly one of the primary things i do as a counselor is I view my job is to just hold up a mirror so that you can see you. And I can tell you how, what I'm seeing of how you're feeling. You seem like you're angry. You seem like you're sad. That seems like it's upsetting to you because they can't kind of, in whatever distress they're in, they can't sort of get their mind and their hands around what they're feeling. So I almost just imagine I'm a mirror and I'm reflecting back to them what they feel. And I'm reflecting back to them and gosh, the, the people can come to their own solutions so well when they have somebody that will non-judgmentally, in love, and out of their well-being and not my well-being, will help them discover who they are by giving them real mirrored feedback. Now that that requires some courage, right? Because I don't like to hear that I'm not good at something. I look at that picture and see that I'm tall, but I also look at it and see that I'm about 20 pounds overweight. I look at that picture and see, wow, I'm tall, and I go, I'm bald. <laughs> I mean, so so. With feedback comes some things that I'd prefer to not see, but if I'm, if I'm going to live authentically and have any chance at becoming who God's put me on this earth to be, I have to see it all. And I have to have people that love me enough and care about my well-being enough uh, to tell me the truth. And they have to do that ideally from a self-aware place too. So bring those two things together. And if you can give people real feedback, they're not going to be fragile. And then they're actually, gosh, the people that are really flourishing life desire feedback. I know, gosh, so many of your, your team there, Adrian, that are saying, help me, tell me, you know, talking to you, talking to Doc and just saying, give me feedback, understanding that that feedback, while it might disagree with what I want my self-image to be, it's actually how I become aware of who I really am. And, uh, and that's how we grow. That, I think, coupled with that anti-fragile, that tough feedback, helps me actually that squeezing helps me become something different than I was. Yeah. So. I, I mean, again, I know Bree has a question, but I really would, because as you're saying this, first of all, I appreciate that. Um, you sharing that because, you know, I'm actually reading a book right now. Um, and it's by, uh, I think it's called think again by Adam Granny, the psychologist for Wharton and, uh, organizational psychologist. And, and one of the things he's talked about is this, this current moment of like, most time we approach, we approach everything in life as a, pa you know, literally he says as a pastor, a politician, um, or a lawyer, you know, it's like pastors, mm -hmm. you're just like, man, you're trying to convince people that you are right. And if they're not, they're morally failing politicians you just want to vote so you'll go either way and you know and, and then the other one is um if you're a lawyer you're just trying to tell people they're guilty right um and he's mm -hmm. like you need to approach it like a scientist where it's like you get the data and the reason why i say that i appreciate what you just said because you know i talk about resilience a lot but what you just did there i'm like as soon as you say well I, you know i think it's a little mm -hmm. bit more i'm like oh that helped me you know what i mean and so i think like you know somebody talks about this a lot in a lot of different areas corporate space i'm like oh man i just got better today i'm like oh that's a really good way yeah. because it is resilience is like the idea of actually when you the definition it's just to it's to go back to the original form mm -hmm. and i think you're right it's yep. like no, no no it's actually to go back not to the original form but to even be better yeah. than the original yeah. form so i think everything I would, yeah, yeah. Ev everything in the created order you'll you'll see it pressure makes it better right yeah. squeezing it you know, we all know rocks into diamonds and all that, but it's, it, it's, it's everywhere. Like if, if you don't let a tree stand through a storm or two, it's not going to become strong enough. And you're not doing that and go, wow, what a resilient tree. It's back where it was. No, I, that thing's going to become a mighty oak, right? And, and 
it anyway so yeah, yeah I, it's, I, it's I, true in the created order so i have a question for this really quick is that when you know i I see this a lot where keith you know doc always says this Mm -hmm. thing you know he says hey trust the spoken word right you know i think a lot of times our anxiety makes us read into other people what they Mm -hmm. think and that creates more anxiety whatever but how do you deal with when people are saying like hey i want to get better they tell you they want to get better Mm -hmm. then you put them in a situation to get them better and then it becomes a then you become like the the enemy of that like you become like, well, sure. like I don't, you know, it's like, and then, it, then a lot of times people can just go right to their mental health stuff, you know, like where, cause that's kind of today's world, especially with the generation we live in and we deal with a lot. It always becomes like, that becomes like the, the default button, right? It's like, well, my mental health. And yep. you're just like, okay, well you said you wanted to grow. It's like, how do you know? I yep. guess the question, like, how do you know when it's like, is there any, is there any reads where you're not trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this, where you're not trying to read into being an expert of someone else, but are there any reads to know? Because you know our culture here, and this is more of a personal thing. You know our culture. We have a very high intense culture because we produce high level leaders. Are there any attributes you should be looking for in the type of people you, you know, when you're looking at people developing as leaders, any attributes you should look for that's going to say they've got some, you know, again, like you said, that the uh, way you put it, the, like the fragility, the anti kind of fragility, like what should, we be looking, yeah, what should we be looking for in that? Uh, yeah. So great, great questions. I think, um, sorry, re- re- remind me the first part of the question. Yeah. The first, and then I'll, yeah, yeah. The first part of the question is that when we are in a culture in a world today where people want to, grow, oh, where people don't want it, you're setting them up in a position and, and they, right, they to, tell you to grow, they want, they, but they're, they say they're they want choosing. to grow, but then as soon as you put them in that situation or they get into the, they get into the, the heat of it, then yep. it's you become the bad guy or yes you know yep. like how do you like yep. maybe is there anything we can do on the front end of that to better read if that person's right for sure. it to go through that process sure sure uh so so i think there's i think there's i think one of the reasons adrian you guys are doing such a bang up job with the kind of leaders you're developing is you believe in people and uh don't ever lose that because the, the tendency can be, you know, you believe in somebody more than they believe in themselves. And then you, you know, you get kind of worn out and burned out or, or whatever. So let's, let's work initially from the perspective that, that we believe in them. Uh, but the reality is for human beings, the number one fear and the hardest thing to do is change, right? The single ask any psychologist, psychiatrist, anybody that works with people, sociologists, social workers, they'll tell you the number one predictor of future behavior is past behavior. The best I can, you know, look like a prophet and a soothsayer. Just you watch somebody, and I, I mean, I can't tell you how many situations I'll, I'll, I'll watch in a family, and I'll sit down with them and go, "Hey, listen, you, you know, let me help you out. If you you need to course correct this, or else." And I could literally write down where they're going to be in five years, seal it in an envelope, and 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 put it there, and they will, because the best predictor of future future behavior is past behavior because people don't like to change. Uh, they, we, we tend to change when the pain of where we are really, really exceeds of the pain of changing or the fear of changing, or we have, um, an overabundance of resources that make change possible or, and we feel proper support. You got to have all of those things for, for people to change. We, we generally don't, it's why, you know, gosh, it's why children of alcoholics vow as kids, I will never drink and I will never do that to my kids. And it is overwhelming number of them do the exact same thing. It is why you can see, you know, the horror of domestic violence and you, you, you talk to, to somebody in the middle of it and it's awful and they'll tell you how awful it is. And you'll be like, well, let's get out. Like, get out. And, and the idea of not knowing what's next is scarier than waiting for the husband to come home in whatever state he's coming home in. It's so people don't like to change. We are without question, even the most innovative among us, we're, we're creatures of habit in the things that, that really matter. So yes, believe in people, but also understand people don't like to change. Now, what I personally think People are much more motivated to change for positive things than negative things. <clears throat> I, I can't tell you how many people I've worked with in counseling that'll get a cancer diagnosis and the doctor says you need to quit smoking or you'll die. 
it's a pretty, pretty negative experience. And they won't quit smoking. But then when you say their daughter will get engaged and they'll decide they want to live for the wedding, totally different ball game. People don't change out of do this or else. We change out of, I want to be here for that, right? It's gosh, positive psychology is absolutely changing the way, <clears throat> excuse me, feedback's being given in the workplace. You know, it's, it's the, it's, we, we tend to focus on the feedback we get, right? So think of, think of a, uh, you know, we talk about little Johnny playing baseball, right? Think of a baseball player and he goes up and he's got a really bad stance and it keeps striking out. So the coach that says, listen, don't, don't, don't hold the bat like that. Don't put your feet like that. Tell him all these things he shouldn't do. When that little guy, or even it happens at the professional level, they go into the batter's box. All they're thinking about is all the things they shouldn't do. And what do you do when you're thinking about all the things you shouldn't do? Your performance goes down. But if you literally just said, rather than, hey, don't hold the bat here. If you just said, hey, next time up, try holding the bat here. They can do that and they're not thinking, where am I supposed to hold that? Hold the bat here. Just, but if you go, don't hold it here, that's what's making you strike out. Even if they do hold the bat here, they're, all they're hearing is, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So I think we can, I, I think people who, who grab quickly to the possibility of what they could become, kind of circling back to your, I guess the second half of that question is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll float out. You know, it used to be like, give people really lousy things to do and see who's willing to serve and grind. And, but I'll, 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 I'll float out a, you know, a possibility of destiny, right? What, what could you, what could you be? Huh? You know what? Try, try that and we'll do this. And um, you'll see who shows up. And I think, I think you're certainly your, your leaders, certainly your resilient folks and make, you know, you can make it a challenging thing that requires some risk uh, that requires some faith that requires, you know, a little bit of uncertainty, but if, if you put something out there that has the possibility of what people can become, uh, that's really, honestly, the only consistent way that psychology and sociology are finding people to change is, is through a, and, and it's been mistaken because it's called positive psychology. So people are going, that's okay. You struck out. You're still the best. That's not positive. That's lying, right? But legitimately going in real feedback, you know, I, I mean, I do this with the, the, our next generation of preachers here. Gosh, there's a thousand things we could critique that they didn't do right. But, you know, it's, uh, I like to say there's two ways of growing good grass. You can go pick out every weed, or you can just grow grass so good and thick that weeds can't be there. And so what I'm going to do is highlight what you do well and give you a practical thing that I want you to do. Uh, and when people have something that they can do, they can usually do something that'll, that'll produce a good result. Wow. Um, so, well, I don't know if that answered no, your question, but I that, enjoyed talking that about it. So. That answers it <laughs> tremendously. And I'm going to pass this to Bree, but I just, I, I can't just, I appreciate you sharing that because it it's making me think of my own life. I'm like, oh, as I said, I'm like, man, I get the greatest results. Like, you know, it is like with, you know, with having a son and, and having your kids, it's like, oh, yeah. my son really does respond when I lay out a vision for his future and he accepts it. You yep. know what I mean? Like I actually put like, cause I always tell people. Yep. You know, everybody who showed up to Jesus, like they came with like selfish, selfish intentions, like something that we don't realize. They came there like, hey, heal me, get rid of this. And everybody's like, no, you come to the gospel. Just like, no, you don't. You come to literally, you don't come to church because of, you know, it's a show. We've made it's like, no, I walk to a restaurant. I do not care about what's going on in the chef and cook's life. I don't. I don't care about yes. the owner. Like, yeah. I want it to be a nice environment. The point is that people come that way. And I think, unfortunately, what we've done, we've lost the because of an overcorrection even in the past it's like casting a positive vision i look at my life when mm -hmm. someone actually pulled that out of me so no i see this for you yeah. mm -hmm. yes that yeah. when someone says hey no no you have the ability when yeah. i was playing basketball they, i think you played this level me yeah. not partying me mm -hmm. not going on spring break yeah. me not doing that stuff was not because they were like hey it was like no no i can see this for you yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. I made the choice and that's what's, you know, and I think that's really, really helpful. I mm -hmm. think for people listening to this again, just only hear yeah. this as you're listening, don't only just hear this from a ministry standpoint or something that's great. like mm -hmm. literally this is like right there in your backyard. If you are a parent or you have a friend who you're yes. trying to help, 
yeah. laying out there because I realized most of my negative stuff that I put out there is literally as I'm thinking, as you're talking, Keith, I'm like, oh, that's all out of my anxiety and fear. <laughs> literally everything I give people yeah. is negative. It's like, yes. and, and because like yeah. it at least releases the anxiety out of me, the mm. negative I'm feeling, yes. it releases the negative. Now I'm like, okay, I'm not taking this, wow. this negative. I'm not, hey, I'm throwing this on you. You take it now. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, yeah. you know, I, I feel yeah. I feel better, and yeah. but it doesn't. <laughs> all right, we got one, all. we got one more question but for again, you. Again, I think it's the done. idea if, if you really if you really sorry if you're really there to to help people, t- tell them what to do, right, and tell them what to do and what you want it to do, and yeah. you can have high expectations with people, and we tend to respond much better to that than what we shouldn't do. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, yeah. great. Next question. What you got? Okay, so final one. Um, just kind of going back to earlier when we talked a little bit about spiritual warfare, but could you speak into the mm-hmm. difference between spiritual warfare and serious mental health concerns and probably the tension between how they can tie together? Sure, sure, absolutely. Th- this is really my main counseling practice now. I'll have uh, counselors in the area that you know that refer to us and they'll refer somebody when it's a spiritual issue. Um, and then I'll have churches that'll refer to my practice when it's a mental health issue so it's you know the the counselors deal with the mental health and then they'll bump up against something and go "Mm, pretty sure this is spiritual and they'll kick them over to us and then the 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 church will pray and shakalaka and bind and loose and go (laughs) i'm pretty i'm pretty sure this is mental health and they'll 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 send them over so we we do sit in this sweet spot quite a Mm -hmm. quite a bit of of trying to help discern i mean i I recently had a i had somebody that was referred to us from a from a church and they the person went to the to the pastor originally thinking something you know demonic a spiritual attack which you know for for those listening look there there is a spiritual realm it does interface with us on a regular basis you do have an adversary you who you know jesus said they he comes to rob and to kill and destroy so if he can harass you and bother you and now you know there are demons but not everything's a demon but there sometimes it is, right? So the question then is how, how do we discern which? And that really determines what you do because you can't, you know, you don't just sort of pray and tell me about your mother when you have something broken in your in your brain, um, nor do you, you know, tell me about your mother and the demon leaves. So we got to know what's, what's both. Um, so anyway, so I had this literally just, you know, in the past week had somebody referred and, uh, it was a it was a situation where they they were referred to their pastor because they thought something was demonic and and usually when you get that it's because they're having you know trouble sleeping or they're hearing voices or they're seeing things and um, and oftentimes somebody has you know significant mental health if they're hearing voices seeing things and the question is what's the cause right is is there something broken in my brain or is there something spiritual happening. And honestly, what I what I usually do is uh, kind of ask a series of questions about what they hear and about um, what they see. And oftentimes, if something's spiritual in nature, it tends to be internal. You know, I don't. Um, so kind of, you know, when they'll be like, "Oh my gosh, I just you know see all these violent or sexual images or whatever it might be," and I'll be like, "Well, tell me, like, do you see them like out there or like on the movie screen of your mind?" And you know, if they're kind of describing their on the movie screen of their mind, wasting what they're saying is they're having trouble with their thought life. And that oftentimes is a realm that's, that's spiritual. If they describe hearing voices, I'm like, so what's what's the voice sound like? And I'm like, what's it sound like? I mean, I, okay, I guess I'm not hearing voices. I just am more having thoughts that, you know, just kind of sounds like me, but I'm thinking all these weird things. And, you know, it sounds like, you know, like if I was reading a book to myself, like that voice, and I'm like, okay, that is either yourself or spiritual. Um, when somebody's having a true like mental health you know, psychotic or delusion episode, it's external of them. So they'll describe the voices. Sometimes there's multiple voices. Sometimes, oh yeah, you know, I say, what's your voice sound like? Oh, wow. It sounds like, you know, a, a lady that's, you know, 35 years old. And then there's another one that sounds like a really angry old man. And be like, oh, okay. As I'm talking to a, you know, white 40 year old, like, okay. So, so we got something different here. Um, it's external. A lot of times they'll describe seeing things that is as clear and external to them, not on the movie screen of their mind, but Actually, their eyes are, you know, picking up and perceiving images that aren't there. This the gentleman the other day had a, he was really describing a lot of physical sensations as well, like his forehead would get really cold. And there was no external explanation of it. And 
So if it, if it feels internal, I tend to go the demonic route. And honestly, if you start praying, if you know how to pray around a spiritual warfare, it's an area where you have authority. So if you start praying authoritatively in Jesus name and it's demonic, you're going, you're going to know because that thing's not going to be happy to be getting evicted and it'll try to fight you like any, like throwing somebody else out of their house. Um, so when in doubt, you can always try to pray. And if nothing's happening on the, on the prayer, if you don't know how to discern, pray. And if prayer doesn't work, get a mental health check. Yeah. <clears throat> but from a, if somebody comes in my office, they're usually expecting me to discern the difference between those two. So wow. I, the big one to me is external versus internal. Wow. That's really, really good. That's really, really practical. And, uh, and I, um, and I, and I appreciate that, Keith, because I think that's always been, as we come to close, it's always been the great balance uh, that I've always loved about you because there have been 20 years. I mean, we've been on mission trips together. We've worked in the church world together. We've been outside of the church world together. And that you're deeply spiritual, but yet and still like, okay, like living like, you know, like real reality. You know, when I tell people all the time, it's like, I love telling like, you know, off microphone, I love telling like Keith Tower, like stories of like, man, spiritual warfare stories. I'm like, yeah, they're just the most <laughs> epic thing ever. Right. But then it's like, but, oh, it yeah. but it doesn't make you. And I think that's where it shows a lot line of your level of health, because what it could lead to is then that becomes like your thing, right? Your mm-hmm. stick would be, oh man, I just mm-hmm. deal with the demonic and da da da. But yeah. then you'll be the first guy to be like, no, nah, man, that man needs to, you know, we need to take him to, you know, he needs to get on medication. Like, and you're very quick yeah. to be able to do that. And I think that yeah. speaks to the reality of, you know, again, why you're good, because it's really what we always talk about here, being a non-anxious presence where you're like, no, at the end of the day, this person getting free or this person doing this, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's not about yeah. it coming out of my hands or mm-hmm. me being the one who does it, you know, and I've watched yeah. you do that in so many different worlds. Um, and so I really appreciate yeah. that. And I think that's what, and again, I think the things I love, whether it's from you or Dr. Zoda or others we've had on here is you can tell when you hear wisdom, yeah. Yeah. you know, wisdom yeah. hits. I tell people wisdom hits different compared to today yeah. when you hear a talking point or someone says something really cool, you know, Oh, that, that sounds great. But when you hear real wisdom, you're like, Ooh, like that goes like deeper into like your soul. Mm-hmm. And so I really appreciate yeah. it. Again, I feel like over the last hour, we've got a lot of just real, just wisdom. And so, you know, Keith, I appreciate you taking the time and, um, and always investing, always investing into our church and, and investing to our community here. Cause again, this, uh, this podcast goes beyond our, um, you know, our world, but it makes a real impact. So Keith really, we really thank you for uh, taking the time today. Absolutely. Great being with you guys. Always a, a pleasure. I love the work that you're doing. And anytime I get to, pop into your world and serve you man it is a uh, the joy of my week so all right. great to see hey, you all. do me a favor make sure you smack ross Middleton in the back of his head for me all right <laughs> all, only the back i got you <laughs> get him a big hand smash <laughs> all right guys well until next time right. we'll be back with you soon on street theology hey so did did we redeem 36 that's the oh oh yeah yeah, yeah before oh, we go yeah. yes i listen yeah, yeah we absolutely i think this was listen this was michael jordan flu game <laughs> Like flu, you know, like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, was it really the flu or was it a Hennessy hangover? We don't know. But what we do know is that it was redeemed. It was, a, you know what I'm saying? Like legendary, whatever shoes you got on, you know what I'm saying? Now we can just go put them out there, you know. You know what I'm saying? The, thir- the, the, the Tower 36s, we can now put them on StockX right now. So, Hey, that's all that matters. <laughs> that's right. it. I love it. All right, Keith, we'll appreciate it. We'll see you guys soon on Street Theology.